Hello, and welcome again to Grasping Scripture. I am glad you could join us. We are delving into the 11th chapter of the book of Revelation today. And as we do that, I, I hope that you won't be lost in the wild imagery that is part of this apocalyptic work, but that you will actually grasp hold of the message that God has for us there. And we'll be digging into that, looking at some of the symbolism, things that it may mean, and really the overall direction of where this passage is, is taking us and what it is telling us. It doesn't stand alone. It is part of the rest of the book. And so I encourage you, go back to the beginning. Start with Revelation 1 in this podcast series and then work your way up to where we are. It will lay a foundation and you'll begin to see some of the ebb and flow and some of the things I reference during today's study go back to those things. So it's important that you have that foundation as you move forward in this study. But I'm glad that you have joined us today and I'm looking forward to this chapter. So let's turn to the Lord and then we'll turn to the text. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. You have blessed us with your grace and your mercy. You are moving all of creation towards the culmination of your plan. And Lord, you give us hope and encouragement. You over and over again show us that you are trustworthy and you encourage us to place our faith and our trust in you. And so, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the confidence that it inspires. We thank you for the, the desire that it kindles in our hearts to, to know and to understand, to hear your voice. And so, Lord, I pray that you will continue to help us as we go through this study to, to grasp hold of your word and to cling tightly to it and to seek your face. Lord, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, and give us a heart sensitive to your spirit. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, coming out of chapter 10, we have just finished that interlude, that that, that pause in the story, if you will. We've had the, the six trumpet blasts. We've had the plagues. We've had the four horsemen. We've had all of that going on. And then there's this pause. There's this stillness. There's this Colossus type figure of an angel with a scroll and he gives it to John and he tells him, eat the scroll. And John talks about how it's, it's sweet in his mouth, but it's sour in his stomach that the, it's, it's a beautiful message, but there is pain. There is suffering involved in it. Then we just kind of ease into the next phase. He's told after he eats the scroll that he has a, a prophetic message for the nations, for all the peoples. Now, when we get to 11, we start to see what that is. And as we go through 11, particularly the end of 11, what we're really seeing is that seventh trumpet blast, if you will, and, and the culmination of the seven trumpets. Now, I've shared with you before this, this idea of a framework for understanding the book of Revelation, that as I see it and as some others see it, and I'm influenced by them, what you have is the same event told from three different perspectives that the seven seals lay out these events all the way until the culmination of God's plan, the day of the Lord. The seven trumpets, same thing, lay out the same story leading up to the culmination, the day of the Lord. And then we'll move into the, the seven signs and that leads up. So we'll, we'll keep doing this cycle if you will. Now you may say, but those are one after the other, and you're welcome to understand it that way. I'm just saying the framework that makes sense to me that I am approaching it from is these are three retellings of the same basic idea from differing perspectives. The first one, the, the seals use the imagery from Zechariah of the horsemen and the different things involved there. As you move into the trumpets, you get more the Exodus imagery going on. Now, let's continue with chapter 11 as we delve into what's happening here. And we get to two characters that, boy, there, there's a lot of debate about. 
the two prophetic witnesses, if you will, um, from the book of Revelation. There we go. Who are they? Who do they represent? Are they specific individuals or are they um, more the, the message itself? Of what, what is this that is going on here? And people love to stick names on things. People love to look at the world around them and go, oh, that's, you know, I can remember several presidents back having a church member that came to me and said, oh, I've been reading the book of Revelation and I'm convinced that such and such who's our president is the Antichrist. Um, no. They weren't. Now, they may have lived their life in opposition to God. I don't, that's We could debate that. But were they the Antichrist of Scripture? Um, you know, it doesn't look like it. So so it's, it's easy and it's tempting to assign labels to the things around us like that. It's also fraught with all sorts of dangers. Uh, the greatest of which, I think, is we begin to miss what God's word is actually saying because we have placed it into a box of our definitions. Instead of letting God's work speak to us, we begin to read God's word in a way that just affirms what we've decided already. So that's always a danger of studying scripture and especially a danger of studying the book of revelation. So we'll delve into this idea of the two prophetic witnesses that get introduced here. But before we get to the witnesses, There is some measuring that takes place. So let's get to the text, Revelation chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Verse 1 reads like this. Then I was given, now this is John speaking, he says, Then I was given a measuring stick, and I was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and the court, or excuse me, and count the number of worshipers. But do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. They will trample the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap and will prophesy during those 1,260 days. Before you start doing all the math, it's three and a half years, okay? Now, What is happening there in those first three verses? Well, John is being given some instruction. That instruction is to go measure the temple, to to take account of the temple, to mark out its boundaries, to say, this is the parameters or these are the parameters of the temple. And it's not just the temple of God, the building, but it is the number of worshipers in the temple. Within the Old Testament temple, the temple even during the time of Jesus, you had the temple, primary temple, and then you had the outer courtyard. The outer courtyard was outside that limiting wall, and it was still considered part of the temple area, but it was where the Gentiles could come. It was where those who were not part of the Jewish faith could come and enter if they wanted to learn about God or become God-fearers, worship the one true God, but not join um, in Judaism, that was the the place for those that that were apart. So what we have here is this representation: the temple of God and the altar, and to count the number of worshippers. Those are the ones that are truly His. Those are the ones that are part of the family of God, God's chosen people, that royal priesthood, that holy nation. And I don't just mean Old Testament Jews. I'm talking from Peter's letter to the church. That means all believers is what Paul talked about. Those that are grafted in. We've we've already seen echoes of this through even the book of Revelation, where they reference Isaiah, that it is from all nations, all peoples that God calls them to himself. So it's not limited, but it is saying there is a distinction between those that are in right relationship with God and those that are not in relationship with God. And those that are not in relationship with God, outer courts and beyond. Those that are in relationship with God, inner courts 
and they are the ones counted. Why would God instruct him to measure and to count? Well, there is a sign, uh, uh, a sign, a symbol there that this is the idea of protection. We we see that echoed from Zechariah chapter two, this idea of marking off and protecting what is delineated out and marked. Um, there's a sense of security. It's it's a message to the believers that God knows your situation. He knows where the boundaries are, and he knows which side of that boundary you're on. And there's a certain assurance there. But he says in verse 2, but do not measure the outer courtyard, for it has been turned over to the nations. So it's grouped with everything else. They will trample the holy city for 42 months. They did. They had. This was written approximately AD 90 and AD 70. They had overrun Jerusalem and the temple and leveled it. So this would have had special significance to the Christians to understand, yeah, the earthly temple and altar has been leveled, but God has marked off what is his and says, it's mine. I will protect it. So there's that that trusting in there. Now, that happens for 42 months, and he says, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will be clothed in burlap. It's a sign of, of grieving, of mourning, of repentance. And they will prophesy during those 1,260 days. So we keep dealing with this three and a half year period. Why? Again, it's part of the number thing from this type of literature. It's it's part of the number thing from that part of the world in this time. Certain numbers have certain significance. Seven is considered a complete number. Three and a half is a broken seven. It's it's half of a seven. It's, it's not to its fulfillment yet. It's not to its completion yet, but it's just part way there. Now we're going to shift to verse four and we're going to start looking at who these two prophets are. All right, now we've made it to verse 4, and we're looking at these two witnesses. And in verse 4, it says, These two prophets are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. Now, there are some references there that have uh, symbolic credence in Scripture. The olive tree reference is something that does refer back to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. The lampstands, we see that back in the first chapter of Revelation, that we have the lampstands representing the churches. So, you know, this could represent Old Testament and New Testament um, standing as witnesses. It could represent, uh, you know, First Covenant, Second Covenant. It could represent individuals, as I think I've already shared. Some see this as being Moses and Elijah. Um, others see it being others, other of the prophets, um, you know, Enoch and Elijah, maybe the whole walked with God and was no more or taken up in a chariot of fire. Um, any of those types of things can be seen as symbolically referred to here. But we don't know for sure. Another idea of what's going on here, and it's where I land, is that this is talking about the church, that the church and its prophetic role and witness in the world are the two witnesses that it's talking about. Um, you don't have to agree with that, but that's the framework I understand this passage in. But let's keep reading. It says, these two prophets are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire flashes from their mouths and consumes their enemies. This is how anyone who tries to harm them must die. Now, what does that mean? Where, where we get that reference? Well, it's actually a reference from Psalms. There's a Psalm that talks about God's judgment flashing forth from his mouth like a fire. Uh, so again, we're using some biblical Old Testament imagery here, something they would have understood. Um, it, it represents a manifestation of the power of God and the judgment of God, and it is ascribed to these witnesses. But wait, there's more. 
Uh, let's keep going. Verse six, they have the power to shut the sky so that no rain will fall for as long as they prophesy. And they have the power to turn the rivers and oceans into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. Hmm. That's pretty big. And if we think Old Testament, we can think of characters in the Old Testament that did some of these things. We see Elijah who would pray and the skies would be closed. And then there on Mount Carmel after that showdown with the prophets of Baal, go back and read it. It's awesome. He prays and God responds by opening the skies and allowing the rains to fall. And it's not the only place we see it. We see it other places. Um, we see plagues. I mean, Moses calling down plagues. Uh, we see that happening. And we can look at it and go, well, that was Elijah's power or that was Moses's power. And we'd be wrong because it wasn't. It was a manifestation of God's power working through them. So whether we're looking at the fire flashing out from the mouths, the ability to, to halt the rain or call the rain, the ability to, to bring down plagues, all of that isn't speaking of the power of an individual human. It's speaking to the power of God being made manifest. God's power was manifest in these witnesses, these two witnesses. So that brings us to verse seven. And like I say, you can, you can have differing ideas on who the witnesses are, but um, they, they are two witnesses. Uh, they represent the manifestation of God's power and his judgment. But in that, there's two of them. And we see reflected in scripture, whether it's uh, you know laws laid out in Deuteronomy for giving testimony and it being valid to to statements in the New Testament by Jesus about having two or three witnesses to declare the truthfulness or veracity of a claim. Here we have two witnesses. That's enough to declare the truth. Now in verse 7, it says, When they completed their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the bottomless pit will declare war against them, and he will conquer them and kill them. Now, this is the first appearance of this beast. Uh, we've had the pit open and and those uh, plagues come out of it already, you know, the locust and all that stuff. But here we have a beast come out of that pit. And that beast is, of course, imagery that, that symbolizes an opposition to God, a standing against him, standing against his witnesses, that beast comes out of that bottomless pit, that place of evil, and declares war against them. And by extension, he's declaring war against God. And he will conquer them and kill them. So they're witnesses declaring the truth of God, being witnesses to God, uh, declaring his judgment, calling people to repentance and to follow God. And the response is, that this beast shows up and kills them. Hmm. This beast shows up and kills them. And in verse 8, And their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, which literally, that here in this translation, they render it Jerusalem. Literally, it says the great city, which is an interesting little uh, side note there by 90 AD to say the great city would have evoked a particular city in the minds of the readers, even the, the Christian and Hebraic background readers here. And the city it evoked was not Jerusalem. They would have immediately thought Rome. But probably he's talking about Jerusalem here, and that's why this translation relates it. Jerusalem. Um, What's the significance there? Well, their bodies will lie in the main street of Jerusalem, the city that is figuratively called Sodom in Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. Ah, 
the Lord was crucified in Jerusalem. Now, this is a huge change. We've gone from city of Zion. We've come from place of God to the temple has been destroyed. The city has been overrun. Uh, the Jews have turned their back on Christ, were complicit in his crucifixion, the Jewish leaders were, as were the Romans. Not an ethnic slam there, it's a statement of history. So now that place is seen as an evil place, a place of sin, a place of, well, it's referred to as Sodom or Egypt, uh, the city where the Lord was crucified. Hmm. So after three and a half years of witnessing, the witnesses are conquered and killed. And then uh, in, in an act of evil, uh, their bodies are left out in the main street to, to be desecrated. There's no honor given the dead. It's, it's they're left out there to humiliate them even in death. And, and we may think, oh, wow, that's so gruesome. But it's actually not foreign. Crucifixion. Christ was an exception on crucifixion that they let him, because of the Jewish nature of what was going on, they let him be taken down off the cross and laid in a tomb. But the Romans normally, when they crucified somebody, that was a public signpost that you do not go against Rome. And they the crucifixions happened along the main roads going in and out of the cities. So that if you were traveling, say, into Jerusalem, you would pass by Golgotha and see dead bodies in various states of decay hanging on old crosses out there as a billboard to say, you're coming into a city that Rome controls, do not stand against Rome or that is your future. Um, that's what crucifixion was. It was a public, it was a horrible way to die. It was punishment for crimes, but it was also a billboard for the Roman Empire. And, and that wasn't lost on them. Well, here they're not hung on a cross, but they're left out in the street for kind of the same purposes to say, look, look, let this be a reminder. So the witnesses of God, overpowered, defeated, killed, left laying out there in Jerusalem. That city no longer called the city of God, that city called Sodom or Egypt, the city where the Lord was crucified. And then in verse 9, and for three and a half days, all people, tribes, languages, and nations will stare at their bodies. No one will be allowed to bury them. All the people who belong to this world will gloat over them and give presents to each other to celebrate the death of the two prophets who had tormented them. Now, how had the prophets tormented them? Well, I think it's that torment that comes with being confronted with our sin. And I don't just mean that that prophetic witness was to, to point out their sin. But we as believers, as followers of Christ, as we live for him and as we proclaim his kingdom, we upset people. The lost world hates us because we are a thorn in its side. We are an irritant. We are a source of discomfort because we remind them of their lostness. When they start feeling some conviction about their sin, when the standard of righteousness and holiness is shown in who God is, it makes sinners cringe and crawl. It is Isaiah who, by all accounts, was a pretty godly man. Isaiah the prophet sitting in the temple having that vision of being in the presence of God in the sixth chapter of Isaiah falls to his knees and says, Woe is me! Because he knew he was a sinner in the presence of God of God. People are not comfortable with God, nor should they be. People are not comfortable with the message of the kingdom, nor should they be, because it stands in stark contrast and by its very nature accusation uh, or conviction it shines a light on sin. 
And for the unredeemed, that is an unbearable thing. So once those witnesses are gone, it makes absolute sense that the lost world would rejoice, would celebrate. Whew, that's over. Wow. Don't have to deal with that anymore. And you can see that sense of of celebration that they had. Now, was that what they should be celebrating? No, absolutely not. That is a short-lived celebration. Um, I can think years ago, and of course it had to be years ago, but years ago, I lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And it was during the time of, of, yeah, I'm going to go there with sports. It was during the time of Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, you know, uh, Michael Irvin, Deion Sanders, all being on the Dallas Cowboys. They were going to the Super Bowl, and it was crazy. I mean, everybody was into the game. They watched the games, but, you know, once the Super Bowl was over and Dallas had won, yeah, there were the hats and the shirts and the bragging rights. But you know what happened at the beginning of the next football season? They were starting at ground zero just like everybody else. Um, what the lost in this, what the nations and the people of the world that are gloating over the death of these witnesses don't understand is it looks like a victory and they're celebrating it like it's an eternal victory. But just like winning a Super Bowl, it is a temporal victory. It is in that moment, but once that moment is gone, you may have won in the past, but you're starting from scratch. It all starts over. You're back to square one, if you will. And I think that's kind of what's happening here as we frame this in a larger discussion. They're celebrating like it's forever. It's not forever. And we're going to see that in just a few verses. Now, as we get to verse 11, it says, but after three and a half days, because remember, they weren't buried. They're out there being humiliated as their bodies literally rot in the street. The people are partying, celebrating. Whoo, that's over. We don't have them to deal with. Then verse 11, but after three and a half days, God breathed life into them. You see, what looked like defeat by the witnesses of God, what looked like defeat became victory. It looked like the beast had won. The beast had power to overcome them, to conquer and kill them. But see, God can do something the beast can't. He can breathe life. But after three and a half days, God breathed life into them, and they stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. The people have been watching, gloating over these dead bodies. Those are the ones that were tormenting us. They're gone. Now everything has changed because God breathed life into them, and they stood up. And they're going, oh boy, it's not over. And the beast that we thought was powerful enough to kill them and bring us ease. His work has just been undone by God. So God breathed life into them. They stood up. Terror struck all who were staring at them. Then a loud voice from heaven called to the two prophets, come up here. And they rose to heaven in a cloud as their enemies watched. Think echoes of the ascension here, except it's not the ascension of Christ. It's the ascension of these witnesses of Christ. Witnesses to Christ and his gospel that are being carried into heaven as the enemies watch, as the lost world looks on. But it keeps going in verse 13. At the same time, so they're ascending. At the same time, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city. 7,000 people died in the earthquake. And everyone else was terrified. And gave glory to the God of heaven. 
What was the witness that impacted that lost world, that lost world that was so depraved and mired in their sin that they gloried at the death of these witnesses? The humility of those witnesses to declare the kingdom of God, to declare his truth and his word, to die for it, and then to be given life again, to be resurrected and called to be with God. And then the lost world responded. It wasn't through the plagues. It wasn't through the horsemen. It wasn't through all that calamity. It was through God saying, those are mine. They're my witnesses. And giving them life even when it looked like they had been defeated. We see echoes of the resurrection of Christ here. That I mean, there's even the reference to it was in that city that they crucified, that the Lord was crucified. Um, and that, that, that three and a half days and that life breathed into them. They're alive again. The ascension. I mean, we, we see echoes of the gospel here and it's the promise for believers. As I understand it, it's a promise for believers that we have the promise of hope and life and a resurrection. Christ is the first fruits of that resurrection, but we join him in that. even though it may look like all is lost, even though it may look like the enemy has cause to celebrate. And then we see that judgment happening, that judgment taking place in the earthquake and the 7,000 dead and all of this as they're watching this ascension happen. But the result of that calamity and the result of that witness or those witnesses ascending into heaven is that everyone else, the ones that didn't die, were terrified and they gave glory to the God of heaven. In verse 14, it's kind of a transition verse. In verse 14, it says, the second terror is past. But look, the third terror is coming quickly. So we've we've had this kind of warning, the first terror, the second terror. Now we're to the third terror. So the second one has passed. We just got past it. But the third one's coming quickly. And then that's our transition in the verse 15, where we start looking at the third terror, that is the seventh trumpet. It says, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices shouting in heaven. So that, that last trumpet blast, that seventh trumpet blast leads into this, this shouting in heaven and, and really this, this hymn of praise and, and adoration to God. The shouting in heaven was this, the world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders sitting on their thrones before God fell with their faces to the ground and worshiped him. And they said, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the almighty, the one who is and who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. Now, got to back up a little bit in verse 17 there because there's a huge shift that took place. And I don't know if you caught it. When we saw the elders praising God back in the first part, what chapter, let me see here. Yeah, I don't even remember what chapter. It's like chapter one, chapter two. Back in that range, we saw this, or maybe a little bit after that, but the first part of Revelation, we see this worship of God and he is declared as the one who is and who was and who will be. I don't know if you noticed it, but there's a shift in what they're praising God with here, that he is now the one who is and who always was. There's no will be. This is the coming of the kingdom of God. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord. 
This is when his kingdom is made manifest across all creation. This is now he has become the, or this now the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So there is no will be. This is the culmination and the, the beginning of eternity. Culmination of creation, the beginning of eternity. As the 24 elders fall on their faces, praising God, we give thanks to you, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who always was. For now you have assumed your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people and all who fear your name. From the least to the greatest, it is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Now notice the wordplay there. The nations were filled with wrath, but now it's the time of your wrath. Um, this uh, fear has come on all those uh from the least to the greatest, it is time to destroy all who have caused destruction. Um, Those that thought they were winning, those that did all these things directed towards the kingdom of God out of evil intent, now all of that is coming back from God as righteous judgment, as righteous destruction on them. So there's kind of a back and forth uh, play with the words there that we see. So what we see here is a culmination of the judgment, the the instating of the kingdom that will reign forever. And then verse 19. Then in heaven, the temple of God was opened and the ark of his covenant could be seen inside the temple. Lightning flashed thunder crashed and roared and there was an earthquake and a terrible hailstorm again the earthquake the hailstorm the lightning and the thunder um, all manifestations of the presence of god uh his his glory his holiness his power manifest over creation Um, again bunch of bunch of old testament imagery brought in there and this idea of the temple the holy temple, the the heavenly temple, that place that the earthly temple was just a, a pale recollection of, a pale shadow of, even the ark, the ark of his covenant, the the ark that the Israelites had, was a was an image, a a model, a representation of the ark that is in the presence of God, and so there we have it. Those distinctions, those barriers are removed. God's judgment is brought forth on the earth for good and bad. It is the great and terrible day. But we see in the seventh trumpet the reign and rule of God for all eternity over the earth. In other words, we win because he won. And there is, up until that last moment, up until that seventh trumpet blast, that third terror, there is the opportunity of repentance. There is the people seeing what was going on, hearing what was going on, and turning to God. It didn't happen through the plagues. It didn't happen through the horsemen. It happened through the witnesses that died and were given life again and entered into the presence of God. It is in humility, it is in sacrifice that the kingdom of God is made manifest. It's not through overt shows of power It's not through military might or political might. It is through humility, sacrifice, a manifestation of the love of God, witnesses to him. 
that the kingdom is proclaimed and that the lost world responds. We need to continue to be faithful witnesses and understand the victory has already taken place. We're just waiting for that seventh trumpet to sound for the culmination of all of it to take place so that we can proclaim with those elders we give thanks to you Lord God the Almighty the one who is and who always was because the will be that's already where we are what a great day is coming I hope you find these passages encouraging we're reaching one of those shifting points, a big shifting point um, in the scriptures. We've It's kind of the halfway mark. As we enter into Revelation 12, we start dividing things up as a, as a, a conflict, uh, two sides of a great conflict. And we'll, we'll unpack that and dig into it over the next couple of chapters. So I hope you hang with us for that. I'm glad you could be part of this study. And let's have a word of prayer will be done. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your blessings on us. And Lord, we thank you that you use us as your witnesses, that you call us to serve in your kingdom, that you let us proclaim your kingdom in your name. You give us the words when we need them, and you give us the opportunities daily to proclaim you and to show others your love and your grace giving them opportunity to respond to you. And Lord, we pray that as your followers, as believers trusting in Christ, that you would help us to exhibit that humility, that humility, that love, that sacrifice, that truly proclaims your kingdom to a lost and dying world. And Lord, we acknowledge we won't always be accepted or welcomed because we align ourselves with you. But we know that we are always accepted in your presence. And we thank you for that through Christ. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.